Hello, I think it's okay to start. Um, first of all, thank you all for joining me tonight. And I hope I have something of value to offer to you within the next 50 minutes or so. I'll try to leave some minutes in the end for questions, should you have any. Now, before I begin, I have to let you all know that there are going to be disturbing images and details in the following presentation. And if you're looking for a feel-good story, then this is probably not it. My name is Carolina, and I'm a photographic artist. Tonight, I will be taking you through my journey from working on a South Australian dairy farm to veganism and the animal rights movement. I will share with you my personal experiences and stories from the farm, as well as observations about human psychology in response to animal rights issues. I will also touch upon the environmental and socioeconomic issues within the dairy industry. There will be less of a focus on my photographic work and more emphasis on the events that took place. So, it's 2019. Me and my partner decide to move to Australia. Our main reason for coming here was economic as well as looking for better and more opportunities. We are originally from Estonia. We enter Australia on a working holiday visa. Now, if some of you may know, this means that in order to extend our stay in the country, we had to complete 88 days of regional specified work. Usually this means farm work. Now in 2019, it was actually quite difficult to find a job which fulfilled all of these requirements. Long story short, we find our first job on a dairy farm. Now, at this point in time, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not vegan because, well, I thought the dairy industry isn't that bad and animals don't get killed for dairy production. Nevertheless, I'm quite anxious about this new job. So I reach out to our new boss and I ask her, hey, do you guys take good care of the animals? She tells me yes. She also tells me that they give special attention to the sick animals. So we get to the dairy farm in April and on our first day there, we take a little tour around the property. We meet our new boss and some of our new coworkers. We get to pet some cows. I thought, well, this isn't so bad. We might be okay. The next day, I have my first shift. I wake up early in the morning for milking. Um, four of us leave to the dairy and start setting up the dairy for milking while one of us goes and gets the animals from the paddocks. I'm so excited to meet all of these animals and get to pay, play with the cows. Now the cows start rocking up um, to the yard next to the, next to the dairy. I reach out my hand to them and to my great surprise, they all take a step back. And I thought, wow, that's odd aren't cows and dairy farms supposed to be super friendly to people? Unfortunately, that was not the biggest surprise of the day. So we started milking and part of my worldview collapsed instantaneously. My heart sunk into my gut as what I saw looked so utterly wrong to me. The cows walked into the milking carousel one by one. As they entered, an automated computer voice occasionally said, deal number, 6342, treated cow, do not milk. We attached automated milking cups to animals' teats, which immediately started pulling milk from the females' bodies. As they were crammed onto their slots on the rotating platform, some animals ate the food in front of them, while others stood apathetically and blankly stared into the distance. Once the animal re animals reached the other side of the dairy, they were expected to get off or they'd be hosed with some water. If that didn't work either, the impatient backpacker working on that side would yell and smack the animals. Those first few moments of milking shook me to the core as I suddenly grasped how we control and exploit innocent animals for our own greed. We put these mothers through industrialized machinery to extract every last bit of milk intended for their babies who we've taken away or already killed. Now, what made this situation even worse is that I take a look around and all of this seems normal to the other backpackers. I thought, 
Am I the crazy one here? Surely this is not acceptable. While I maintained my composure, I got back to my room. I cried for about two or three hours. I could not believe what we are doing to all of these innocent animals. And I really, really wanted to leave. My partner got back a few hours later. He was on the tractor feeding animals on that day. So he had the nice job. We talked a bit and he convinced me to stay because it was so difficult finding that first job in that year. So I endured, I endured a few more days, even though things only got worse. This is a story probably from my third day on the farm. I was hosing down the yard after milking when I noticed a cow had given birth to a small calf in a nearby pen. The tiny calf was bellowing but the mother had zero interest in her offspring, which is common if the newborn is dead or weak. I asked other workers to come and do something as it was maybe my third day on the farm. Another backpacker joined me and decided to bottle feed colostrum to the premature cow, making sure that newborns receive their first nutrient rich milk within hours of birth is essential for their health. A few minutes went by and the calf's breathing was accompanied by a bubbling sound. Finally, more experienced local workers came to take a look and determined that this calf was too premature to survive. Not only that, but the other backpacker had accidentally gotten milk into the animal's lungs. A local worker decided to put the animal out of their misery and attempted to suffocate the calf, but failed. Everyone decided to leave as the tiny animal was barely bellowing anymore. I stayed around to pet the poor animal as they slowly perished away. Throughout this whole incident, I cried. This helpless baby animal was rejected by their mom, had their lungs filled up with milk by an inexperienced worker, and then was just left to die on their own. How could people just walk away from this? This was the first time I experienced hopelessness on this farm as there was this tiny baby animal in front of me suffering and I wasn't really able to do much. Now, despite this awful incident, by the end of the week, I decided to stay. I figured I could leave and nothing would change on this farm anyways, or I could stay and I could use my photography to tell the stories of these animals and maybe change a mind or two. So for the next three months, me and my partner worked on this dairy farm and every free moment I got, I used for photographing the animal stories. People, my friends, acquaintances kept reassuring me that things will get better, you will get used to this, but witnessing every new death, every awful incident, every suffering animal was as painful as witnessing the previous one. And I think it's a twisted idea to accept cruelty as normal or desensitize ourselves to something that we've always been doing. But this sensitivity of mine also meant that I was going to be depressed for the next three months. It's one thing to experience personal hardship and push through that versus witness someone else, or in this case, many others suffering and being una unable to do much about it. So let's start from the beginning of an animal's life. As many of us know, uh, dairy cows first have to give birth in order to start producing milk. Now, this birth is shortly followed by the separation of the mom and the baby. I often saw the separation of these animals afar while cleaning. And even from a distance, the pain of the animals was obvious. Whenever people would enter the paddocks where these new moms and the babies were, the animals knew what was about to happen. They all went into protective mode. And unfortunately, one time I was the one who had to take away the babies. I was working a morning shift and another worker said that the herd manager needed my help. I was not sure what was about to happen, but I had a bad gut feeling. I met with the herd manager and surely enough, I had to take away newborns from their mothers. We drove to the paddock with a buggy and a small trailer. 
We went from cow to cow, and I had to pick up the babies and place them onto the trailer. While I was doing that, the babies and the mothers started bellowing. As we drove within the paddock, mothers would chase the trailer where their calves were. One male calf was especially strong. He got so distressed on the trailer, he managed to jump off twice. I was sobbing while taking away the young animals as I witnessed the pain I caused. I tried to be as gentle as I could, but this did not alleviate the animal's pain. I felt like a monster. The herd manager saw my distress and tried to soothe me after we had collected all of the calves. Unfortunately, she might have enjoyed the drama as she asked me to help her out again the next time, which I refused. So this disturbing sight of separation is followed by another disturbing sight as these new mums are then forced to go onto the milking platform where we collected their colostrum to feed the newly born babies. Now, these females hadn't been on the milking platforms for months. They were fidgety, they were scared. Their genitals were still swollen from the labor and they often still had placenta hanging out of them. It was a disturbing scene seeing a new mother um, who had just given birth treated as a milking machine. After we had taken away their colostrum, we had to send them to the milking herd out in the paddocks. But these mums did not want to go. They would hang around by the gates, bellow back towards the dairy where they last saw their babies. And I can say that it's an awful feeling trying to force these distressed mothers to walk away from the dairy. Now that the animals are separated, workers have to look after the cows. Unfortunately, on our dairy farm, the calf mortality rate was very high. We had very poor calf management. Um, the main person in charge of the calves did not do proper colostrum feeding right after birth. The milk tank for calf feeding hadn't been cleaned for months. We all know what happens to dairy milk um, in warm temperatures. And the medical treatment was inconsistent or inexistent. And this is a point I would like to get across, is that we often learn about abuse and torture cases, and while these are horrible, neglect is a far more common reason for animal suffering on farms. While footage of torture um, incidents reaches millions of people, many, many more animals are dying simply because workers aren't attending to the responsibilities. So what happens to the cows? As we know, females enter the same cycle of abuse their mothers have endured, and the males, most of the males, get killed at maximum two weeks of age. A few male calves might be picked up by hobby farmers, and some Angus calves get um, reared for meat for the next 18 months, but the vast majority of them end up at a slaughterhouse. In Australia, 450 to 500,000 bobby calves are slaughtered each year. Now, what's even worse is that since these males are pretty much up for immediate, immediate consumption, they're denied harsh medicine which would linger around their bodies for longer. Hence, many bobby calves cannot be properly medicated and thus live very short, painful lives. One of my most painful painful memories is related to a bobby calf on this photo. I would usually check on and play with male calves every day. One day I came across a boy who was not able to move, nor was he interested in drinking milk. He had a large bony frame and I could tell something's very wrong with this animal. A fellow worker speculated that the calf had probably suffered some sort of brain damage. I patted him for a while, to which he responded positively. This was one of the most hopeless scenes on the farm for me, a disabled baby animal whose short life in this world was utter misery. While patting him, I knew that in a few days, he would get a bolt punch into his skull, followed by the slitting of his throat. This was an encounter which represents utter hopelessness for me. And the bobby calves was a topic which was hotly avoided on the farm. In general, people went out of their way to avoid un unpleasant information or situations. 
for example, the bobby calves were taken away every Tuesday morning. So the slaughterhouse contractor came there and picked them up, but all of the workers would avoid the calf area at that time as they did not want to see that. Uh, another example is that during the first week on the farm where I was completely oblivious to the situation about the bobby calves, my co-workers recommended me to not get attached to these animals. And that's an absolutely insane idea to me to derive these animals from, a, a, from affection to protect ourselves from pain. This only makes the lives of these boys even worse. Another common response to confronting situations was acceptance. Oh, well, this is the way things have always been. I'm only one person. I can't really do much. And there was zero questioning of our own consumption habits. One time I suggested to a fellow backpacker that I should really go from vegetarian to vegan, to which she responded, I don't want to go vegan. I don't make a connection between these animals and the meat I consume. The cognitive dissonance and avoidance, um, the reaction, uh, this shows how strong these defense mechanisms are, but I was not neutral to these mechanisms either. Even though I experienced a paradigm shift during my first day of work, I did not go from vegetarian to vegan immediately. My background in sports had instilled in me a Jim Bro mentality about protein consumption, and all of my meals contained animal products in one form or another. I assured myself with lies so I wouldn't have to change my own habits. For example, I firmly held on to the myth that animals are not killed in the dairy industry. In the beginning, I never saw a truck taking the spent animals from our farm to the slaughterhouse. I told myself that old cows are put on a paddock somewhere on the property where they can enjoy the rest of their lives. In perspective, that's an absolutely ridiculous idea to have of a profit-driven industrial farm. Deep down, I knew I was in the wrong and I should stop supporting the industry. So this lie I told myself um, got shattered pretty quickly as I found that found out that a spray paint painted letter C on a cow's bum meant that they would be called, which means that they would be sent to the slaughterhouse. I knew I was in the wrong, so I kept looking deeper into animal rights issues. So I decided to look more into the most avoided issue of dairy farming, the bobby calves. Uh, I searched for some footage about how the male calves are killed at the slaughterhouse and the first few frames of that footage, I knew that animal products are coming off my menu for good. So these defense mechanisms um, are really strong, which protect our inner beliefs and fragile little egos. And it's especially true of things that are convenient for us. I do think that the key to change is powerful emotion most often or not, um, that emotion is pain. But how are people supposed to experience that if everyone's so shut off to the negative information coming out of these farms? So, as calves, sorry, um, I think we're missing a few photos from there. Yeah, I think so. Is it possible to fix that? Sorry, some photos jumped out of order. Yeah, so number 15 and I'm missing those from that onwards. All right. So as calves get past their first four weeks of life, the most critical period in terms of their health and mortality should be over. However, there are exceptions. Can I get the calf with a broken leg? I don't know, something's wrong with... Um, Okay. 
can you just go to the 19? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so after the calves get past their first four weeks of life, the most critical period in terms of their health and mortality should be over. However, there are exceptions. This calf and some of her friends decided to escape a paddock. Unfortunately, in the process of doing that, she managed to break her leg. I found her next to the farm's dirt road, shivering and unable to move. She was very afraid of me. I asked a fellow worker if he knew anything about this. He said yes, and he assured me that he would take care of it. The next day, I find out that this animal was lying there the whole day because no one took the time to put her down when needed or everyone was overwhelmed with other work. And that's an interesting thing about our farm because no one wanted to do the dirty work, but no one really wanted to take proper care of the animals either. A coworker of mine told me that he was lucky to kill an animal with eight bullets. Another time he told me that he went to pick up an animal who the herd manager had already shot, only to find the animal with several bullets inside her still alive. This animal was left in a tiny pen on her own at the edge of the property. Both of her eyes were patched up to cure pink eye, hence she was unable to see. Unfortunately, she wasn't provided with food or water on a regular basis as workers had just forgotten about her. After one and a half weeks spent in this pen, her eyes were healed and she re was released back into the, her herd. This calf and many others um, from her herd died of ammonia, most likely caused by a stressful event, in this case, transportation. These animals traveled about 600 kilometers to our farm. Um, they're denied food and water 12 hours before and throughout the trip. Furthermore, these calves had to endure cold, rainy water throughout the weather throughout the trip, which le led to the deaths of many. Now, another story is of an adult cow, 1802, and it really shows how a small mistake can make everything go wrong. 1802 started going into labor during milking and hence was separated into a small pen. Unfortunately, the labor did not progress after a few hours and workers had to step in and start pulling the calf out. Usually, the calf is pulled with a rope and some muscle power, but in this case, the calf had gotten too big for this to be successful. A C-section would have been the correct approach, but no worker on the farm knew how to perform such an operation, nor would we invite vets to the farm for individual animals. Hence, the rope tied around the calf's legs was attached to a buggy and the young animal was pulled out. The calf was already dead and massively overgrown as a worker had marked down an incorrect due date for 1802. Unfortunately, the troubles didn't end for 1802 as she started getting a fast buildup of gas in her rumen. This is deadly if left untreated, hence she was stabbed in her stomach. I came across 1802 the next morning when she attempted to escape a holding pen but ended up slipping and falling. She was unable to get back up by herself. We lifted her back on her feet with a tractor, but this was only a temporary solution. 1802 was put into the sick herd where she died about two days later, most likely due to internal injuries from the labor. Even though she had been abused by the industry for five years and experienced immense trauma in her last days, 1802 was very gentle and friendly with me. I brought her food and water when she couldn't move around anymore. While animal welfare is one of the biggest issues of dairy farming, there are considerable environmental problems as well. As many of us know, it's estimated that it takes about 1,000 liters of water to produce one liter of dairy milk. But where is all of this water spent? A conservative estimate is that a dairy cow can drink 85 liters of water a day. Now, if the 
if the cow is a high yielding um, milk cow and it's a hot day, she can drink up to 250 liters of water. Given this information and that we had about 2,000 animals on the farm, the conservative estimate is that we spent about 170,000 liters of water per day solely for drinking. Then there's also cleaning. We had a hose running throughout milking six hours in the morning, six hours in the evening at least. We had to put through a wash cycle through the milking system after each shift. We had to hose down the large yard from a layer of feces. And in order to keep the paddock screen, we had center pivot irrigation systems. We had about five of those, and they all spanned 1.2 kilometers in diameter. These can easily take up to a million liters of water per day. Now, they weren't running every day, but they would be occasionally turned on depending on the weather. This is a satellite image of our dairy farm, and it really shows the, the stark contrast between the big areas that were kept green and the drought-stricken country around it. And we used, used fresh water from our most precious water system. In its worst performing years, 19% um, of irrigated water in Australia is used by the dairy industry. In the past, dairy farming has taken up 35% of irrigated water from the Murray-Darling Basin. The cows also need to consume large quantities of food. On our farm, animals were fed dry forage, wet forage, supplemented by concentrates. The dry matter requirements per animal were about 11 to 25 kilograms. Um, this means that on our farm, we spent 34 tons of dry matter per day for feeding. And my partner who did the feeding some of the days said that this is a pretty spot on estimate. So the few male animals who live longer in the industry are used for breeding, but before they can be released into the female herds, they had to be tested. And this was the only time where a vet showed up on our farm. The bulls were put into this livestock crush and the vet stimulate, stimulated them with an electro ejaculator. After collecting the sample, they did a quality check and if everything was good, they were released into the female herd to do their thing. Now, the topic of impregnation is something I'm going to play a devil's advocate in. Uh, many animal rights movement people say that um, artificial impregnation violates the animal's bodily autonomy. And I completely agree with that. But having seen how things happen the natural way, there are things to consider about that as well. First of all, while it's difficult to determine consent in animals, females were usually trying to escape the advances of bulls. Another thing to consider is the significant weight difference between the females and males. It could be up to 500 kilograms, and if these these animals are trying to mate, there can be injuries. Most likely these injuries were related to legs or hips, but if a female got their back injured, that would mean that they had to be shot. Genetic issues are more likely to be passed on when the, with the natural way of things happening, as well as bulls would give uh, diseases to the females. I also know that artificial, there's some artificial impregnation technology which can determine the sex of the calf before impregnation, meaning there's no need for males to be born, there's no need to send them to the slaughterhouse. Obviously, I prefer the bovines to be left alone, but our arguments against artificial impregnation aren't strong as it can prevent a lot of suffering. And speaking of suffering, we had about 15 to 35 animals in the sick herd at any given point of time. One would think that these animals received more empathy from workers. Unfortunately, that was not the case. At all times, the sick herd had animals with mobility issues. They would be limping or barely able to walk, but they still needed to 
still needed to be milked. So impatient workers were yelling at them, they would honk the car at them, and some of them would even physically bump into the animals with the car. It was a heartbreaking image seeing these already suffering animals treated so cruelly. One awful story about a sick cow um, is of an animal numbered C920. She gave birth and developed an intense infection after that. The herd manager separated C920 into a nearby paddock to take care of her soon. Unfortunately, she completely forgot about her and C920's condition deteriorated really fast. In a few days time, I saw her and she looked like a complete zombie. Her eyes were so far sunken in, you could barely see her, her you could barely see them. She had um, stability issues, she was disoriented, and she was aggressive towards people. She wanted to be left alone. Every time I saw her, I cried. Things were so bad, I was going around the farm and asking people to please end her suffering. My wish was, was rejected, and she suffered for two more days until the manager shot her. Another incident with a sick cow is about a cow who had eye cancer. I drafted her from the main milking herd into the sickies, thinking that the vet might show up one day and take a look at her eye and treat her. Well, this cow ended up being super feisty and she wanted to rejoin her friends. She jumped a tall metal fence and in the process of that, she managed to completely scratch her underbelly. Now she was physically fine, she was just a bit bloody, bloody and scratched, but the next day I find out that the herd manager decided that this was a good idea to send this animal to the slaughterhouse. So I tried to help this animal, but instead my actions led her to the slaughterhouse. My care for the animals was looked down upon by fellow backpackers who bullied or yelled at me for taking extra time to look after the animals. Unfortunately, they also let their steam out at the animals. Their level of stress would correlate to their aggression towards the animals. Usually they would just become super impatient or they would yell at the animals. Um, people refer to cows, and I'm sorry to say these words, as bitches, cunts, and retards, and the worst of them would occasionally kick them. Even the nicest girl lost her cool under stress. While no aggression towards animals should be tolerated, I must say that working on a dairy farm is rough. You wake up in the middle of the night for the morning shift. You're constantly covered in feces or smell like it. If you're standing and cupping for hours, you get an aching back. If you're working consecutive shifts from the evening to the morning, you only get three hours of sleep. You might be paid illegally low wages. My partner and I were lied about the actual pay rates until we received our first paycheck. And backpackers are especially exploited since many of us don't know the rules and regulations in Australia. Furthermore, many working holiday makers are just willing to put up with the awful conditions as they want their farm days to be fulfilled to gain that extra year in the country. Now, among local workers, there's a lot of people who cannot find employment elsewhere. We met a lot of people with addictions or criminal records. I know of one former employee who sold the male calves secretly from our farm in exchange for wheat. And obviously, poor employment conditions lead to poor animal welfare. I felt incredibly incompetent working on this farm. I was only taught how to clean and milk. There was nothing about the cows, their health, or even what to do in an emergency situation. Now, I wish I could say that the local, more experienced workers were better, but I'm not sure that was the case. For example, this one time, we were closing down the dairy and 030 became a downer cow. So we left her, left her with some food and water and gave her some gave her some fluid injections we left a note to a specific worker at the office to look after her in the morning 
The next day, I rock up to work and I find out that 030 is dead. Apparently, another worker decided to take the matters into their own hands and um, used a tractor to pick up the animal. Unfortunately, in the process, he managed to drop the animal. She broke her leg and she had to be shot. Now, I wish I could say that was his first time doing that. That was his third time doing that. Another thing to consider is that workers don't stick along, around for long. Backpackers come and go every three months. Now, that's not a long period of time to uh, learn proper skills or knowledge. And people just don't care. The long hours and poor pay don't justify the extra work which needs to be put in for animal welfare. Another question to ask is that, how can you take away a baby from an animal who you care about? Or how can you walk a cow who you care about onto a slaughterhouse truck once she becomes spent? Finally, there's just no financial incentive to take, to take care of all of the animals. It's expensive to give individual attention and some of the animal losses can be written off the taxes. After years of abuse, the spent dairy cows find their way to the slaughterhouse around age six. Others end up in a mass grave. My partner, my partner took me to the open grave on our farm as he had had to take away dead animals before. The smell of rotten flesh hit us 500 meters away. As we get closer, there are more and more bones and ear tags on the ground, foxes. From afar, I first saw a pile of calves as they weren't proper, properly thrown into the hole. Once we finally reached the grave, I saw the adult animals inside. I recognized a few animals like C920, who was a literal zombie in her last days. The newest victim's eyes have been picked out by birds. The older bodies are bloated and starting to show signs of disintegration. In the bottom of the pit are piles of bones covered just with skin. The hole was about 5 by 15 meters. This grave brought me back memories from school when I was shocked by the confronting images from different wars and mass murders in my history textbook. Human or non-human mass graves both confront us with piles of tortured bodies, the senseless scale of death, and absolute disregard for life. Now, half of the animals in this pit were calves, and while people might say, wow, this is so sad, to me, these animals were the lucky ones. The females escaped the years of abuse ahead of them, and the males were spared the awful end at the slaughterhouse. Now, even though these images are some of the most troubling for people, I find that seeing an animal alive and still suffering is far more troubling to me than seeing a dead animal who is hopefully already at peace. These are some of the ear tags I found on the farm, and this is maybe all that's left of them and possibly an old file, uh, an old file on the computer. After working three months on the farm, we left and I felt immediate relief knowing that I don't have to witness all of the suffering every bloody day. However, I remained very worried about the animals who we left behind. Obviously, this experience led me to veganism and a new focus on animals and environmentalism in my phot photographic work. While I found a new sense of meaning I per and purpose, I also experienced absolute hopelessness, which was reinforced by my fellow human beings who are unwilling to face the suffering around us. If people are confronted with this type of cruelty in person, and if that doesn't elicit any change, then what will? So since completing this project, um, photos from this series have been awarded, have been shortlisted for awards. Um, some of these images have made their way into magazines and group exhibitions. Um, if everything goes well with um, money, then hopefully I will have a solo exhibition back in Estonia. And far more importantly, these images made their way back to the animal rights movement as 
many photos were used for the February dairy campaign. Now, my work on animal farms did not end here. Me and my partner went on to do contract work on cattle and sheep farms and stations throughout Australia. Since I wasn't directly working with animals anymore, my focus shifted on the environment, but I still documented animals as much as I could. I can confidently say that there's no big farm anywhere where all of the animals' medical needs are met. And I've yet to mis visit a farm where there's zero negligence. So this year, I spent three months at a wildlife sanctuary where I took photos of the overwhelmed and depressed wildlife carers and rescuers and the animal survivors of the destruc destruction we have caused. While doing that, I learned about the massive lobbying which goes against wildlife protection, the industrial kangar kangaroo slaughter backed by the Australian government, and the corrupt wildlife organizations. So here, I would really like to make a note that um, if you do want to donate your money for a wildlife cause, please do so to individual wildlife rescuers or carers who usually do everything they can to save every life. And please do not donate to big organizations which can spend thousands on advertisements and fancy events. Finally, I want to thank you all for listening to the stories of these animals. Please feel free to come up to me and leave, or leave any feedback or say hi. If you want to see this photo project in full, head over to my website. There's also my contact information. This work is dedicated to all of the animals I met on the farm and especially to all of the bobbies out there. Thank you. <laughs> So I don't know if you guys have any questions or no? All good. <laughs> Thanks.